Good morning, everyone. Fantastic to be together with you on this Sunday morning. If you don't know me, my name's Donovan, part of Common Ground Constantinburg, along with my wife, Heidi, and my two little girls, Rachel and Rebecca. Always good to gather together with uh, the Common Ground regulars. And of course, you might be joining us from Greater Cape Town, even South Africa and beyond. Uh, and if that's you, thank you for joining us this morning. It could be that this is your first time in church ever, or maybe first time in a long time. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm sure we're going to have a good time together. What can you expect from today? Well, we're going to have a time of singing as we celebrate and glorify God. And Rigby is going to speak to us from God's word. We're going to share in communion or the Lord's Supper together. So you might want to get those elements ready. And then you're also going to need a pen and paper as Rigby leads us in an, in an exercise a little bit later as uh, part of the message response. And then I'm going to wrap up for us. Um, let me just say hi to the kids. Great to have you guys with us. We are a family church where we can. We like to do things together. So why not stay together as a family as we sing? And after the time of singing, we do have age appropriate material prepared for your kids. So you'll find the links in the description to the video. Why not set them up with a device so as you listen to Rigby, they can engage in some stuff that will interest them. Before I lead us into a time of singing, I wanted to share a picture that my wife felt God was laying on her heart in a time of prayer we had earlier this week. It was a powerful picture, and I trust it's going to be an encouragement to you. She saw this ship being battered in a great storm. I mean, you can picture the huge waves, thunder, lightning, a thick fog. The sailors don't know where to go. The captain can't make heads or tails of of where to orientate himself, except this, this compass that's kind of stuck onto the gunwale of the ship. At the same time, she had this picture of this gorgeous whale, kind of beautifully drifting through the ocean, through these big waves in the same stormy weather. And yet this whale uh, was totally at ease and totally orientated. And the big difference is that the whale has this internal compass that kind of gives it direction and orientation, even in times of great storm. And as I've reflected on this picture, as we've spoken about it, it's a huge encouragement for us as Christ followers to remember that, that as we live with the life of Christ within us, the person of the Holy Spirit within us, that we can feel at peace and we can feel quite at home, even in the midst of great trial and storm. You know, it can be that uh, from time to time we look outside of ourselves for some comfort, for some security, for some hope. And yeah, we can find some, but ultimately as Christ followers, our greatest hope, our greatest anchor, our greatest peace comes from this compass that orientates us from within. And of course, as God orientates our lives through this compass, he forms the people that we're becoming. He causes us to, to lean towards others towards the lonely, the marginalized, the poor, those in need of encouragement. And so as Christ followers, let's take some encouragement. Let's remember to keep our eyes on Jesus, to stay focused on the life of Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit that can bring us peace and orientate us even in the midst of the great storm of life that the world is in right now. So we're going to go into a time of singing and I hope you're ready to celebrate and worship our great God. I want to read a text from Philippians 2. It's a, a text that describes the wonder of this God who leaves the comforts and ease and beauty of heaven to enter into the human experience, ultimately to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And on the cross, he doesn't just die for the sins of the world. He dies for your sins and for my sins. And so through faith in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, we can experience fullness of life in God. I mean, that is worth singing about. Let me read Philippians 2, 8 to 11. Speaking about Jesus, it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing and celebrate our great God together. Declare His praise Who 
can stop the Lord Almighty. Now God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Now God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Who comes to say this year is set the captives free? Who can stop the Lord? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness Talk through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross is spoken
very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried
Let's pray together. Father, I've got those words ringing in my ear. No fear of death from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. Thank you, God, for your sovereign power. Thank you, God, for your love, for your intimate knowledge of each and every one of our lives. Father, as we we watch those faces on the screen, it's, it's a reminder for us that you see each and every one of us, that you know each and every one of us, and despite knowing us so deeply and so well, you love us so extravagantly. Thank you for giving us life in Jesus. Thank you for continuing to give us life and life to the full as you form us more and more into the person of Jesus through the work of the scriptures, the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, we pray this morning our worship was sweet to your ears, that you enjoyed the celebration of who you are as we extended our hearts and our praises to you. And God, I want to freshly invite you to continue to work in our lives, continue to form us and shape us as we give ourselves to the scriptures. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. What a fantastic time of singing together. If you've just joined us, uh, my name's Donovan, part of Common Ground Constantiaberg. I wanted to quickly mention a couple of things before I, I hand over to Rigby. The first one is just to let you know that, that all the congregational leaders and many of the preachers are dying to get behind the pulpit and speak to you as soon as possible. I'm sure you're feeling the same way. You're wanting to hear some familiar voices and get that congregational feel. Well, as much as it is good to celebrate our church family and, hey, I encourage you to just enjoy getting to know different voices and different people that are shaping who we are as a citywide church. I want you to know that we're working towards uh, creating more space for preachers, for local congregational preachers. We're just building our capacity at the moment in our media team. And on that note, let me just say a huge thank you to our media team. I mean, can you, who could have imagined just a few weeks ago the critical role these guys would have been playing in the life of our church? And my, they have just done such an exceptional job producing incredible material. So a heartfelt thank you to all you guys. And hey, we look forward to the day when you get to hear us preaching uh, to our own congregations. Another note, I just wanted to again say thank you so much to those of you who continue to be generous towards the local church, their regular committed giving. Uh, I know it takes faith in seasons like we're in now to continue to, to sow obediently as God calls us. And, 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 and we believe with all our hearts that God wants more for us than he wants from us. I also just wanted to draw a note to that document. If you're a member of Common Ground or you call Common Ground Church home, you would have got a message sometime last week pointing you to a short video and a document that's a financial update uh, across all the Common Grounds. Um, I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, to just take a little 10 or 15 minutes out today to make your way through that dock. Okay, it's time for me to hand over to Rigby. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a deep and meaningful message for us today. I think God's got a really treasured word for us. We're going to bring our hearts, we're going to bring our emotions and our experiences to God. And I'm trusting that, that he'll meet us in profound ways. So over to you, Riggs. Thank you, Don, for hosting this first part of uh, the meeting. Uh, I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Rigby Wallace, married to Sue, uh, two kids, six grandkids, and uh, together we uh, give leadership to the Common Ground Story with Ryan and Kate Termesazen, who lead the Rondebosch AM congregation. And we serve uh, a team of 11 amazing congregation leaders and their staff and their leaders uh, to, to serve the city and to care for uh, our people. Uh, I want to just remind us that uh, irrespective if you're in your pajamas or uh, you know, still lying in bed, it doesn't matter, come just as you are. But the big thing I want to remind us of is that when uh, Jesus walked this earth 2,000 years ago, he gave an amazing promise. We might be in lockdown, but we're not locked out of this truth. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And my sense is that God is turning our homes and our relationships into uh, many churches in a way that is just absolutely wonderful from God's perspective. I want to speak to you this morning on a, 
a, a, a title called Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. I get it from a lament, Psalm 137, and I'd love just to uh, invite you to read it with me on your devices or in your Bibles or follow on the screen. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We'll read a little bit more of the psalm uh, later. But just for those of you who are, uh, who are sort of dating yourselves by the rivers of Babylon, remember that, Boney M, uh, the German pop band, popularized uh, a song by that title. And essentially, uh, uh, they were singing a lament of the Rastafarian community uh, who were trying to uh, uh, protest for the legitimization of marijuana. Uh, my sincere hope is that this morning we'll take you a little higher uh, than that motive. I want to focus on the question in verse 4, how shall we sing the song of the Lord in a strange land? How do we bring our lament in this season of, uh, of great difficulty before God? And of course, uh, we've got to answer the question briefly, what is a lament? Rather than express our emotions, we tend to hide them, thinking God is too aloof, or distract ourselves from feeling them, or we even pretend they don't exist. When difficult circumstances cut into our lives, we are likely to seek out false saviors to rescue us. We bury ourselves in work, entertainment, or a tub of ice cream. We might even take things into our own hands and attempt to control our circumstances. We do anything but face the pain and heartache we feel. That's Christina Fox from The Way of Lament. Friends, Scripture is filled with laments, Habakkuk, Habakkuk uh, laments the coming judgment of, uh, of Israel. Uh, Jeremiah in Lamentations, it's a whole book, he's referred to as the weeping prophet. Jesus himself cried out in lament in the garden. And folk, the book of Psalms, which was the hymn book of the early church for the first 300 years, was a book that had one third of the Psalms or laments, where poetic songs are sung and where people learn to give voice to their sorrows and their pains. The laments in Scripture do more than just voice painful emotions. The Psalms of lament in particular go further than just releasing pent-up emotions. They are more than mere catharsis. Within themselves, these Psalms are theology, a doxology, a form of worship. They are reminders of truth. They are exercises in faith. They are transformative for the believer. And there's much we can learn from them. Perhaps you're not yet a Christ follower and you're wondering, where do I fit into this story? And I want to say to you that you are as important to God and to us in this moment in, our, in history. And I think there's much to learn, as you'll see, uh, around bringing the authentic, real self before God through the vehicle of these songs of lament. The patterns of lament usually go from negative to positive, from sorrow to joy, from fear to trust. The laments capture essentially the journey of our souls. In following the way of the psalmist, we can learn the art of lament and we can cry out to God in our pain. Even if you're taking baby steps in a journey of faith, uh, these are things that God hears and will respond to. Now, I need to just say this up front. Uh, some of you are already in a season of deep lament. Some of you are carrying massive sorrows. You've experienced huge kinds of loss. And I just want to say to you that, uh, that our hearts go out of you and we're broken that some of you are, are suffering in ways that you've never, ever uh, thought you, you would be exposed to. 
But I also want to acknowledge there might be others who are needing to thaw a little. So as we go through this talk, uh, it's possible some will say, wow, Rigby, it seems like you're recognizing exactly where I'm at in, in my journey. And others will be feeling, well, I'm not quite there yet. And the good news is over a period of time, we're probably all going to need to learn uh, the, 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 the wonderful uh, disciplines and art of lament. Let me just also say that I'm no psychologist, but I am a pastor who cares deeply. And I stand in front of you as one who, together with my wife, Sue, we have prayed many tears in the last few weeks and uh, our hearts uh, have cried out to God in the ways that we have not in years past. So the first question I want to answer from this lament in Psalm 137 is what's behind their lament, the people of Israel, where they locate themselves by the waters of Babylon. There we sat down and wept. There we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lives for there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth saying, sing us the songs of Zion. By the waters of Babylon are essentially the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers in modern day Iran. And what I want you to notice is they're a long, long way from Jerusalem. It's going to be a long, long time before they head back home. As a matter of fact, 70 years, which means in their lifetime, those exiles are never going to be back in Jerusalem. They've migrated to a new geography under a new political and economic uh, authority. They're occupiers in uh, Palestine or Jerusalem are now uh, their lords in their lockdown. And they're eating a very large slice of humble pie. Notice also that they sat down and wept when they thought back to the homeland, Zion. Godly, God had sovereignly permitted a judgment that he had warned them against for decades and take decades as he sent prophets. And now at, in this scene of judgment, they're now under the discipline of God. It seems like God is arresting their spiritual ADD, their attention def deficit disorder. And they're weeping in loss but probably also weeping in repentance. Why? Because the losses at the waters of Babylon, uh, as they reflect, they're capturing their personal and corporate sense of grief. The loss of family connections, the loss of the land, the la loss of homes, the loss of certainty, the loss of the established rhythms of gathering in a regular way, the loss of of the temple and proximity to God through the feasts and worship. What a tragic decline. And you only know how precious something is when you lose it. And there on the willows, there we hung our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs. Sing us songs of Zion, they said. These tormentors wanted to be entertained by their songs from the home country. They're being mocked. And in that, some of their weeping is the weeping of humiliation because the songs of Zion were more than cultural artifacts. They were the story of God's saving plan. And from where they sat, they felt on the outside. They wept in humiliation, but also in sorrow for this loss of temple proximity to God. How do we sing the Lord's song in this strange land? They cry. The second question I want us to answer is, does this lament capture our lament in lockdown 2020? I was with Sue the other day. We were walking just before lockdown and on one of the green belts and uh, she was just weeping and crying. And I said, what's up, love? She just said, I don't know. There's this overwhelming sense of burden, some unknown experience of grief. And uh, 
I can locate myself in the Psalm and I invite you to do that. There's also a sense of migration that we've all uh, suddenly realized. We've migrated away from everything we knew six or so weeks ago and we've almost woken up in a new world. It's a world that we don't know. It's a world that we never saw coming. And it's a world that right now, if we're honest, we don't understand. The treadmill that the world's been on for decades has just stopped. And the feeling is like being in a terrible bicycle crash. And so in these uncharted waters, we are like the exiles, experiencing real loss, real grief, real fear, a real sense of disconnect from our community, a loss of certainty, a loss of peace. We're living with a new and unknown enemy for the foreseeable future. And it's utterly, utterly unsettling waking up in this kind of world. For Sue and I, it's our sense of, of future. It's as we think of the future for our children and our grandchildren in a world that they're about to inherit. And we have not been able to protect them from this. And folk, I can pray tears for that. But right now in the city of Cape Town, think of our neighbours in under-resourced areas of Cape Town. Right now, they can't work, they can't eat, and they can't practice social distancing, and many of them can't wash their hands on a regular basis. Friends, there's a new kind of grief that everyone's trying to make sense of in Cape Town, South Africa, and the world. It's called anticipatory grief. With a virus in play, this kind of grief is so confusing. We know that something bad is looming, but it's out of sight. We're feeling the loss of safety. And both as individually and smaller groups, Historically, we've been able to lament around funerals, memorials, uh, you know, uh, death of loved ones, circumstances. But this feels totally different to anything we've had. Never have we been in a moment in history where everyone all over the world seems to be carrying the sense of anticipatory grief. We can look back and grieve for what we've lost. We can experience right now current grief for what we're losing. But anticipatory grief is the sense of deep uncertainty. And if it's allowed to brew in an unhealthy way, it can produce in us deep anxieties. But there's something else going on here that we can identify with uh, those exiles in Babylon. I believe it's uh, important for us just to reflect for a moment on what God is doing. What could God be doing in all of this? I believe, and I've said it before, God is slowing the world down to arrest our attention deficit disorder. Is it possible that God is giving us a gift in strange, unusual wrapping in this time? The gift of a giant reset, not just for health inequalities, not just the reset for, uh, uh, for, for caring for the world's poor, but a reset for our individual and personal lives and how we relate to God. Could this be a gift in our season of lament? The third question I want to ask is, how does this psalm, and might I say one third of all the psalms, how do they help us express our own lament? Laments interpret the world through a biblical lens. That's the beauty as we read these laments we kind of get a new worldview. And Christians, followers of Jesus, lament because we know the long arc of God and we can see how out of sync our present lives are to that. The arc of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. We know Christ has come, but the world is still in agony and broken until the restoration of all things. And the Psalms remind us that the world in which we live is not as it ought to be. And if you're exploring faith, we invite you to lament with us and uh, explore this ark 
the story of God in and through the whole Bible, but particularly through these laments. As we go through these Psalms, we, we, we're exposed to uh, God's due north for our lives. There's that upward pull on our lives, which is so beautiful and so powerful. It's also as we read these Psalms, we discover as it were permission that we can give to ourselves to, to feel and to express, to develop maybe for the first time, some of us, what I call emotional eloquence, where we can start to stir up some of those suppressed emotions and find a new vocabulary for that. And one of the big upside of these laments is that they, they, they show us how we can relate to God in a raw, authentic and real way. Again, to our friends among us who are exploring Christianity, uh, you'll see so much in these laments of how approachable God is, how uh, God uh, is not disillusioned with us in totality because he has no illusions about us in the first place and he invites us into the story and into this soul pouring. And the best kind of lament is where we learn to raise our white flag to him and acknowledge our need for him. Some in seasons of great sorrow, instead of running to God, uh, they run away from God, run away from a means of grace. But listen to this language from some of the laments. For I'm languishing, O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. Why do you stand so far off, O Lord? Psalm 10. Why do you hide yourself in time of trouble? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Psalm 13. And of course, in Psalm 22, Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's absolutely insightful here is the interrogating nature of these questions. And it paints a picture of a marvelously loving and secure God who can handle our doubts, our griefs, our tantrums, and even our accusations. This is so liberating in terms of inviting us in to uh, bringing our own laments before him. Now, David Brooks, who's a New York columnist that I love reading in the New York Times, uh, on the 9th of April, he, he asked his readers to, to uh, send in their, uh, their laments to describe what they're feeling. And in one week, he had over 5,000 letters. And as I reflected on that, I began to invite stories from the congregations that we work with across Cape Town. And I would love you to participate in being a witness and an ear to what I've called a scroll of lament. And I want to invite you to do a few things as you sit there in your homes. I want to invite you to listen in an undistracted way. I want you to try and listen to the cry, listen to the words. They're not perfect articulations but they are cries from the heart. More than listen, I want to invite you to be a witness because that's what a person lament needs is a community who are listening. Let's listen. And let's also in this moment identify and ask the question, are there any echoes of their laments in my own life? Maybe this could inform some of how I will write down and record my own laments in the coming days and weeks. And then after that, we'll just pray for a moment. Let's watch the screens. Uh, what makes me sad on, on lockdown is my parents don't listen to me. I miss the school library. I'm sad because um, coronavirus is spreading that lots of people have it. I miss going out for my birthday. We know there are massive challenges facing our country and feel guilty about the privileged position we find ourselves in. Still, homeschooling our kids is hard. We're not able to get through half of it, trying to both work at the same time. We've never been this busy and our marriage is turning into more of a partnership. These last few weeks have been an emotional roller coaster, 
Being single has never been so hard and I have never felt so isolated. The sense of fear is what is getting to me. Everyone is so fearful. It doesn't feel like the world will ever be the same again. We don't trust each other and it feels like the body corporate is policing your every move. It seems unfair that the very same people that struggle on a daily basis are the very same people that are bearing the brunt of the virus due to lack of food, housing and health care. We thought that bringing a baby into this world was supposed to be a happy, community oriented exciting journey. However, we've just felt isolated and lonely. What's more, being COVID-19 positive, we are still uncertain about the long-term health effects on our baby boy. My family's income just went to zero. We've got enough in reserve for a few months, but after that, I don't know what's going to happen. I have faced many hardships in my life, and it has seemed like there has really been a time to come up for air. The thought of another such hard time due to Corona is almost too much to bear. I'm missing my friends from school. I'm sad that I can't go to places like the park. That I don't go everywhere in any places. I just have to go in the house and it's different for me and I feel sad. I was supposed to get married last week. Now I don't even know when our wedding is going to happen. It's like the biggest day of my life has just been swallowed up in this crisis. And I don't know when it's going to happen or even what our wedding is going to be like anymore. We feel trapped in this small space. We want to exercise in our yard and smell the fresh air and the plants, but we can't. We don't have a yard, let alone flowers and grass. We are cramped together. There is no space even to do stretch exercises. We feel like prisoners without a prison uniform. Our kids are crying every day to play outside, but if they go outside, they're on the street. There is no space. Wow. Let's just pause a moment. How heart tenderizing is that? Finding it hard just to charge into the rest of this talk. I'd love just to invite you to pause with me for a moment. Let's come before God. Let's pray for these folk who've had the courage to share the stories. Let's bring them before God together. Won't you join me? God, these cries from the heart are, are cries that tenderize our hearts and break our hearts. And we want to lift up these lives to you, the stories, the context, the painful realities, the feelings of shame and sin and guilt. We want to pray that you would have mercy on these precious lives. More than that, Lord, the echoes of their stories that are triggers in ours. God, we ask you to help us. Help us as we look to you in this time. Free us, Lord, from the need to present a face of strength Help us to have the courage and to be strong enough in this time to bring the reality of our own soul pouring. Help us by the power of the Holy Spirit in Christ's name. Amen. David Kessler is regarded as the world's foremost expert on grief and he says, if we can name it, call it what it is, that's what all this vocabulary is helping us to do, then we can manage it. And together with uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, written a book called Finding the Meaning of Grief Through the Five Stages of Loss. And since then, uh, David Kessler, Kessler has written a, a book about a sixth stage, which I'll mention how do we manage this grief? And there is the spiritual side as a pastor, but there's also 
what I want to point you to is some of the psychological realities. And there's benefit in understanding some of the stages of grief that they allude to. A little bit of a disclaimer is that these stages are not necessarily linear. Neither are there a, a map or a quick fix solution to self-manage our pain, but they're more like scaffolding to help us rebuild our lives as we make sense of this new world. The first stage they refer to is the sense of denial using the lockdown experience is the coronavirus uh, won't affect me, a kind of a numbness, a kind of excluding oneself from the, the national narrative. There's also a stage called anger. They're making me stay at home. My civil liberties have been messed with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we throw these soulish tantrums. And there's bargaining, like I'm going to insure myself from, from the pain by uh, and any sense of loss. I'm going to practice social distancing, wash my hands and regularly, and et cetera, et cetera. And everything's going to come right. And then the more honest stage is there's a sadness. I don't know when this is going to end and it, it grieves me. And finally, there's a stage called acceptance where we acknowledge this thing is happening. It is what it is. And we've just got to find a way to cope and everything ultimately will be okay. We accept it with hope. But now they've added the sixth stage, which they've called finding meaning. And they've got their own take of that. I'm reading this issue of finding meaning through the lens of Psalm 137, the lament of the people of God who's lost so much. And they're asking the question, where is God in our pain? C.S. Lewis says that in our times of joy, God whispers. But in our times of pain, uh, pain is a megaphone for God to a deaf world. And... Uh, I believe it's so important for us in this recalibration of the world, so to speak, that we ask the question, uh, where is God in all of this? St. Augustine defines sin as to be turned in on oneself. And it implies that uh, salvation is the reversal of that, where we move away from self-centeredness and a kind of spiritual narcissism. And we start to look up away from ourselves. And repentance is about acknowledging our sin, our darkness, our shame, and our inability to, to, to save ourselves. We need someone bigger and kinder. And sometimes that is part of what happens in seasons of pain and grief and disappointment. There are opportunities to look up. And of course, gathering together in worship is a wonderful way where we sing these songs as we did earlier in our time together and what we'll do later. Uh, and in the coming weeks and months, singing songs are about focusing ourselves away from ourselves to someone who is wiser, more loving and kinder. Worship reorientates me to a new life-giving center away from my self-sovereignty, away from my narcissism and helps me to see God as he really is. Psalms, Psalm 137, uh, as we read those words, we're also listeners and witnesses to their lament. And maybe this Psalm and other Psalms give us a template to, after today, in the coming days and weeks, to, to work with, to write some of how we could express our, our sorrows in this season. We'll also be pointing you to our website. We've got amazing resources to help us not just hear a talk, but to actually go on a journey that uh, is healing and wholesome. The last question we want to ask of the text is where do we take our lament and what do we do with it? And of course, it's pretty obvious this upward pull on our lives is toward God. We take our lament to him as a prayer. We take it to him as a soul pouring song. Why? Because God is the one and the only one who can help us make sense of what we're going through and also coach our hearts and our lives to the other side of it. Perhaps God is arresting a lie that sits in our culture, in our media, 
that God has kind of sort of switched off and he's abandoned the world to itself. And yet these laments and this psalm that we're looking at is a reminder that God has not done this. And the reason we bring our laments to God is that God is the God in our story. More than that, in and through his son, Jesus Christ, he came to suffer with us. Let's look at these uh, quotes from Augustine first. Man's maker was made man, that he ruler of the stars might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that the truth might be accused of false witness, the teacher be beaten with whips, the fountain be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. Wow, what an amazing quote. And then this second one, which is uh, Edward Shalito from his poem, uh, God Has Scars. This is the last verse. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has scars, but thou alone. Not a God has scars, but thou alone. This is one of the unique claims of the Christian faith is that the one who entered into history uh, 2,000 years ago, the second person of the Godhead, he became a man in every way like us so that he could identify with us. He could represent us to God and he could represent God to man. What a beautiful, beautiful truth and reality. And here's the thing that just arouses my heart to worship is that right now, Jesus Christ The God-man has wounds in his hands and in his side. And those wounds were raised into heaven. He is a wounded savior even today in the heavens and can identify with us as a God who has scars. So we can take our sorrows and our laments and our griefs to one who is familiar with our sorrow, but also familiar with, with our sin. On the cross, he bore both our sorrows and our sin. In prayer this morning, as I was preparing my heart for this talk, my wife and I were praying and I was reminded of the the words of, of Jesus when he came to Jerusalem and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you, would not. What I love about this is, is we, we're learning to lament, but we need to learn from Jesus that his lament over us took him to the cross. His lament on the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His lament in the garden on his way there shows us a God who laments. He's not just wanting to comfort us. He's wanting us to marry our laments to his And friends, in a season of loss, we are so prone to identify with the stuff that we've lost. And we're crying out for relief from our perceived needs. But when Jesus wept over Jerusalem, it was not for their perceived needs. It was for their actual needs. They needed a savior. They needed forgiveness. They needed to come home. They need to experience the scandalous, irrational love of God for sinners. And these laments are vehicles for us to come to God. They're vehicles to, for us to encounter God and to express ourselves to God. I want to wrap up with just this question. How does God respond to our laments? And we're going to look at that last verse uh, or the verse of the part of the psalm uh, that I want to read to you, verses five and six. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem 
above my highest joy. How does God respond to our laments? Well, I believe he hears them. It's so important that we, that we know this, that we believe this. These are not just things we do to sort of self-manage our pain. The promise of the scriptures is that God hears us. More than that, he draws near to the brokenhearted. But one particular thing he does in this psalm, in the lament, and it's recorded there for this community of exiles and for future generations, he's reminding them. He's reminding them of Zion. He's reminding them of Jerusalem. And through the new covenant and through the work of the cross, I believe God wants to point us to our ultimate Zion that new heavens and the new earth, that new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. God wants us in our lament to have an appetite to experience this upward pull to a future and greater glory. It's not only about sorrow, it's being reminded of what you lost, but it's also about being reminded of what's waiting for you in the future. I just love the fact that in this strange land we can sing the songs of lament with faith and we can sing them to a God who suffers with us. We can sing them to a God who's watching over us, wanting to gather us, but we can also sing against the backdrop of whilst we have lost so much in this season of history, there's a whole lot of stuff that we can never, ever lose. And that's what he's reminding his people of in the lament. He wants us to know that we groan toward glory. This light and momentary affliction is achieving for us a a far greater glory, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And so I want us to come before God and I want us to to hold those two, two things in tension. Yes, we want to bring our pain to God, but we also want to anticipate with Him all and rejoice in all the good things we have the great salvation, the assurance of faith, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the community of the church, the fact that we can now go to breaking of bread as a means of grace. These are his gifts to us. I want to pray and then I'll coach you on communion. Let's be before the Lord. God, it feels like we're in a very strange land but help us in this season to be under your wise hand. Christ, have mercy on us. Help us to bring to you both our sorrow and our sin. Help us to raise our white flags in serenity to you. God, we are so sorry for pushing you away if that's true of our lives. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, we bring the city of Cape Town and our brothers and sisters in in these poorer communities, we bring them to you and we cry out to you, God, have mercy. Help us, Lord. Heal us as a nation. Bring us to our knees before you in great dependence. Lord, what we're facing is bigger than governments and the wisest minds can resolve. And together we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. God, have mercy. Folk, now we're having an opportunity to have communion in our homes. And uh, if you're still exploring the claims of Christ, don't feel under any pressure to try and make this, this happen. But for those of us who are Christ followers, I want to read to you from uh, Hebrews chapter 4, 15 to 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As we gather in our homes and we get our bits of juice and bread together, let's take that bread in our hands and let's, and the cup in our hands, and let's lift them like Jeremiah said, the lamenting prophet, He said, we lift up our hearts to you with our hands. What a beautiful sort of upward posture of faith and dependence 
and uh, perhaps you can pray for one another as families with uh, children, bring them in from uh, what they've been doing in the program this morning, and let's make this a time of uh, being before the Lord. Thank you for listening to me. You're in our prayers. We as uh, congregation leaders and small group leaders and uh, so many, we carry you in our hearts, and, uh, but not as much as Christ. Have a great week. Shining forth in glorious worth You're the source of all Proclaiming truth and love and wrath The sovereign judge who rules on high Yet prince of peace Who came to earth to die for us Exchanging sin for his righteousness The Son of God Christ have mercy Lord have mercy Christ have mercy on us we pray creation our hope is in you Jesus author of salvation our hope is in you Jesus cornerstone foundation our hope is in you
Christ have mercy on us we pray Thanks Rigby for leading us in what has been a really uh, brilliant journey I think it's a journey we're going to have to be going on a, a lot not only I mean, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, uh, hey, in the coming years and decades, I think this is a message that really can mark our lives as we learn a, a new uh, experience and expand our relationship with God. And that, Riggs, I just wanted to say uh, on behalf of all the congregational leaders at Common Ground, uh, we just love you and Sue. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for the way that you're leading and impacting us as congregational leaders and Christ followers across the city really love and appreciate you guys so much. You'll also notice in the description of the video, in terms of just following up on this theme of lament, uh, we've put three devotions, uh, five-day devotions, seven-day, four-day devotionals uh, in the YouVersion Bible app that you can click on. There. You might want to take the opportunity to make your way through those uh, reading resources in this week, daily devotionals. One of them is a, a daily video resource. And hey, maybe God wants to massage this uh, theme of lament and enduring difficulty and hardship deeper and deeper into your life. And that's a fantastic opportunity to do just that. And then finally, before I sign off and invite you to go to your congregational Facebook page where there's a, a leader from your congregation that will be going live shortly, I want to let you know what's happening in the next couple of weeks. Uh, over the next three weeks, uh, we're going to be putting our Mark series aside for three weeks, and we're going to be entering into 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to be doing a series on comfort, hope, and certainty. And we're trusting God that it's going to speak powerfully to our circumstances, to our now, uh, to our context of what God's doing in and through us uh, at this time in this city and even beyond. So, Thank us again for joining us, trusting that God's met with you powerfully this morning. May continue to do that as you go about your weeks. Don't forget to make your way straight to your congregational Facebook page. There's a leader who's about to go live and chat to you. God bless you all. Till next time.